Hey everybody and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host Ashley Mova and this is The Daily Show where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies plus a little bit of insight into what it all means. Joining us as always is John Campia. Well greetings and salutations everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related program on the planet Earth coming to you from right here at the Collider Studios here in Burbank, California and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here John Schnepp. Hey, what's going on? We're saving marriages one show at a time. <laughs> That's what we do for you. Do not forget it. Also, here is Mark Ellis. And while we're saving marriages, we are not shaving our beards. That's right. we, just, we, we, we called each other and we said no shaving, including Mova. Yes. Decided nobody shaved at this table. Um, hey, guys, listen, before we get started on the show today, um, it... Uh, I was here in the office actually on Saturday and uh, got the first tweet that came across about that, uh, you know, the star of the movie They Live and uh, someone who's just been a superstar to a lot of us our whole lives, Rowdy Roddy Piper, uh, passed away the other day. And, and, you know, normally maybe I wouldn't bring up, you know, the passing of a, of a star who was like in one movie. They, they didn't really have a Hollywood career, but They Live was such a great movie. And... You know, I, I grew up a wrestling fan and watching Rowdy Roddy Piper, man. And, and for those of you who are fans of The Rock, there would be no Dwayne The Rock Johnson had there not been a Rowdy Roddy Piper, the guy who, like, created the art of mic skills and whatever. And I wanted to bring in, like, prop coconuts to hit each other over the heads <laughs> with today. But um, the passing Roddy, I mean, all of us on this uh, panel, to one degree or another, have had a chance to meet and get to know Roddy. You, you were actually working with... Uh, with uh, Piper too. Yeah, it's, a, uh, it's horrible news. Roddy is one of the nicest and greatest guys I've ever had the chance to hang out with. And, uh, you know, our project is not going to happen. And unfortunately, for the rest of the world, we, we lost a great and, and uh, amazing talent and a great person as well. You guys actually, he came in and did some Schmo stuff too. He did a lot of stuff for Schmoes. I actually had the pleasure of going to his place and filming him for our Expendables review way mm -hmm. back in the day. And I knew him not as a wrestler. I, I didn't even know who he was until I came out to LA and I started hanging out with him at the comedy store because he was doing some stand-up. He was a great storyteller. And we became buddies. And uh, and we stayed in touch. And he always, if you ever need anything from him, he would always give you everything he had right up until the end. So it really, it broke my heart and uh, I miss him and my heart goes out to his family who I'm also pals with. So the I hope everybody's hanging in. The first chance I had to meet Roddy Piper was about eight years ago at uh, uh, the, the Fan Expo in Toronto. And I was walking down this, uh, this aisle and he was just standing there talking to somebody. I'm like, that's Roddy Roddy Piper. Like I thought I was gonna crap myself. Like that's <laughs> Rowdy Roddy Piper. And I just remember it's like, hey, um, I'm with this. At the time I was doing the movie blog, I'm like, I'm with this little website, the movie blog that I run. It's nothing, it's nothing. Would you mind if I just ask you questions? He goes, absolutely. And he, <laughs> and he pulls up two chairs, let's sit down. We just end up sitting and talking for like a half hour. Like he was just that kind of guy. He loved to entertain people. He loved to make people smile. And it was just, we've just lost like, and I just saw him at WrestleMania. We went to WrestleMania a couple right. of months ago and he was there. And, and he was great, I heard. I wasn't yeah. there, but I heard he was phenomenal. Real quick story. One time I saw Van Halen in 2007 and I came from the concert to the comedy store and on the porch was Rowdy Roddy Piper and he introduced me to Sergeant Slaughter. In what? one night, what? I got to see Van Halen and hang out with Roddy Piper <laughs> and Sergeant Slaughter. It was the coolest night of my 13 year old or my adult. <laughs> See, Judd Apatow would make a movie out of that night in the mm -hmm. life of Mark Ellis. And it, well, thank you for making me feel very untalented for not making a <laughs> film about that. But uh, yeah, he was just, he really was, he was a sweetheart and he was a badass and, uh, and I miss him. And he's a great storyteller. I mean, great literally, I got a chance to moderate one of his panels in Indianapolis and he told a story about him wrestling a bear. And it literally is one of the funniest stories. You guys can look it up. I mean, yeah. he, had, he has Piper's Pit. So you check that stuff out and listen to him and enjoy Roddy Piper. You know. All right, let's get on with the movie news today. All right, it's Monday. That means it's time for our weekend box office report, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Coming in at number one this week is the fifth installment of the Mission Impossible franchise, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, making $56 million, well over the initial projection of 40 to $45 million. In second place is the new vacation film, bringing in $14.8 million on its opening weekend. And the number three spot is the Marvel film Ant-Man taking 
taking in an additional $12.6 million to bring its domestic three-week total up to $132 million. And fourth is the Universal animated film Minions, making an additional $12.2 million to bring its four-week total up to $287 million and a worldwide total of $855 million. Rounding out the top five is the Adam Sandler comedy Pixels, which brought in $10.4 million in its second weekend for a two-week domestic total of $45.6 million. Mark, what stands out to you about this week's box office report? What stands out to me is that if Donkey Kong and Pac-Man ever attack Earth, call Tom Cruise. <laughs> He's the guy that's going to rescue us. I'm so excited that Mission Impossible 5 beat projections by about 10 to $15 million because it was such a good movie. He hung out on the side of an airplane. Everybody was impressed, and the movie actually held up. It's nice to see when we give a film a good review and when you hear critically it's getting a good reception. You have Tom Cruise. You have this fun summer blockbuster. The movie was moved up five months so we could see it earlier and it wouldn't have to compete with The Force Awakens. It was clearly the right move oh, for Paramount. Yeah. And uh, the fact that Vacation didn't do as well, it's that maybe people are starting to pay attention to like, you know what, this movie's getting really good word of mouth, this movie not so much. Same thing with Pixels and Minions. I mean, you, 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 you see those numbers that Ashley just said, and it's just, that thing is a beast. I, don't, I didn't think the movie was that good, but kids love Minions, I guess. You know, and I think Tom Cruise would probably himself would say that the reason a Mission Impossible did so well was because of our positive review. I think he will. I think he will flat out. <laughs> he say watched that. our spoilers review and he liked my shirt. <laughs> he goes, "This now, this is going to work." <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, Mission Impossible deserves this. It absolutely deserves this. This is a fun, wonderful, entertaining time at the movies. It is kind of embodies what a summer action film should be, and it was high quality across the board, well shot, all that kind of stuff. Vacation. I still, ex despite the negative word of mouth, I expected Vacation to come close to projections and be at around 30. It gets less than half of that. So word of mouth just shot out like wildfire. Now, I know a couple people who actually I spoke speaking to yesterday who actually went to go see it. I still have not gone to see it. I got to go see Vacation tonight, I think. Because Christian told me it was terrible, so I didn't bother. Christian, Cr Christian despised the movie. I thought it was okay. I, I didn't like it, but it wasn't horrible. There's laughs you can have with it. Right, and that's what I, I had a couple of people tell me yesterday that, you know what? I ca actually kind of liked Vacation, so my interest is big. I got to see it. But yeah, I was surprised that it came in as low as it did. Pixels, man. You talked to us a month ago and say mm -hmm. Pixels in its second week. Two weeks, $45 million. I mean, I, I just... Did not see that coming. So those are the things that stand out to me. Schnapp, what about you? Stands out the Ant-Man is number three. He's still doing uh, really well. Week. And that's yeah. also word of mouth. I think Mission Impossible and Ant-Man have incredible word right. of mouth. People are saying, hey, you haven't seen that? You've got to check it out. Oh, I definitely will next week. So that's that carryover that kept Ant-Man in the top five and especially in the top two. I, I wanted to be number two. I still haven't seen Vacation like you. Came close to being number Came two. Very like close, two yeah. million. And I, I'm especially happy the Mission Impossible did so well because we all thoroughly enjoyed it. I think it's one of my favorite action films of the year so far. And uh, it's good that everyone else is enjoying it. So that means we're just going to see more of this uh, this Mission Impossible 6 right. coming out soon. And, and, and this weekend is going to be a battle between the, the very well-reviewed, critically accepted movie. And we don't know what we're getting with Fantastic Four yet, right. but the, the, the word of mouth <clears throat> isn't on that what it is. It's the opposite of what has been so far in Mission Impossible 5. So... Well, you know what? There, there is no word of mouth because Fox well, won't well, let well, anyone well, we see will get, it. We will get to that later. <laughs> All right. We will get to that later. All right, what's next? <laughs> Remember last week when reports were swirling around that Channing Tatum was planning on leaving the upcoming Fox <laughs> film Gambit? Well, apparently those reports were bogus. The Hollywood Reporter has revealed that Tatum and Fox have finalized their deal, which could see Tatum playing the role of the kinetic energy harnessing mutant for 10 years. The report also reveals that while there were a number of minor sticking points in the contract negotiations, it was nothing outside of the normal back and forth always presented in these types of contracts and that the deal was never in any jeopardy as Tatum and Fox have both been committed to this project for some time. John, are you surprised at the outcome of this Tatum as Gambit drama? Nope. I mean, we said on the show when we first talked about the stories going around that, look, like, he's he's going to be Gambit. This is He's already committed to being Gambit. He's He already went to, he surprised the audience of Comic Con by showing up on the panel there as Gambit. This isn't going anywhere. This is, he's going to be Gambit. He's going to be Gambit. I actually ended up talking to somebody this weekend 
who is close to the whole thing, he says, this whole report about the things falling apart again, he goes, it's nonsense. He goes, there, this was never in trouble. There was never any, they, there, was, there was trouble over points of the contract, but never was this contract in jeopardy. Never was this deal in jeopardy. It was always going to happen. So once again, we are let down by those who break news um, that just throwing stuff out there that has no basis in truth. So it turns out everything turns out. I think most of us on this panel, we suspected this was the case. We suspected, look, you're, you're not going to Comic-Con and showing up on the panel and say, hey, everybody, I'm Gambit. If you're not damn sure you're already mentally committed to doing this, so I'm not really surprised at all. Anyway, Schnapp, what about you? I thought maybe he could do a Mission Impossible and tear his face off as of Taylor Kitsch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really Gambit. I'm back. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I don't think any of us thought for a second that Channing Tatum wasn't going to be Gambit, especially after all that press. What we were talking about is like, huh, maybe there was a little ruffle after that $150 million news drop. Yeah. 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 And I think that probably was it. And then, you know, one. One website carried a, a story saying, you know, there's some people, you know, concerned. And then everyone went with that and said, he's Not fired. Concerned. He's the quitting. Was, the report was Channing Tatum is planning on leaving Gambit. That was the report. And it was untrue. And yeah, everyone untrue. went with it. So um, I'm happy that he's still on. I mean, I don't think we ever really quit. We're like, ah, I guess it'll shake out and we'll see what happens. So, bam. Yeah, I mean, you see the Internet buzzing about something. Then you read the actual story that caused all the buzz. And the actual story said, no, it's probably just some sticking points. So, yeah. I mean, you see this all the time in sports. Like, you'll you'll see athletes negotiate with their teams. Like, you, you can see Tom Brady negotiate with the Patriots. You know he's not the, – the Pats aren't going to let him go. But there might be some sticking points. So, it's just when we see in the entertainment world, sometimes people get a little more, I, I don't know what's happening now. But – but this was the assumption all along, and I'm glad it's true, by the way, because I think Channing Tatum is going to be a fantastic gambit, and I'm glad that they locked him up for as long as they have him because he could make a lot of good movies in this franchise. Yeah, now you announced to me four years ago that Channing Tatum's going to be gambit, and I'm like spitting in your face. Mm -hmm. I mean, not literally. Yeah. Maybe literally. <laughs> maybe. I'm not, I'm not, maybe. It depends on the mood I'm in. I'm surprised. But, you know, Gan look, look, give everybody their due. Channing Tatum is one of these guys who he was terrible for a long time, and I... I you know, I won't sugarcoat that. He's awful. But he started to find his stride about four years ago to the point now that I am actually, I look forward to seeing him perform movies. I think he's a damn good choice to play. Now, would he have been my first choice to play Gambit? No. I like a lot of people. I I really would have liked to have seen Taylor Kitsch been given another go at Gambit, but I guess they really want to separate themselves from that movie <laughs> like yeah. as much as they can. So I understand that. That being the case, you know, he still wouldn't have been my first choice to play it, but he's one of those guys that would be like, yeah, I'm okay with that choice. And I think he will be pretty good at it. And the fact that it sounds like he's committing to it for like 10 years to play this character, the report in The Hollywood Report says it's going to be much like um, you know, Hugh Jackman's Wolverine. He's going to be in his own movies. He's going to be in the other X-Men movies. He's going to show up all over the place. And, and that's a good thing. So I'm, I'm personally pretty happy about it. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those are the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? The first trailer for the upcoming Zoolander 2 has hit the web. Star Ben Stiller describes a new film like this. It's 10 years later, and most of it is set in Europe. It's basically Derek and Hansel 10 years later. Though the last movie ended on a happy note, a lot of things have changed in the meantime. Their lives have changed, and they're not really relevant anymore. It's a new world for them. Schnapp, buy or sell the new trailer for Zoolander 2. E equals MC Hammer. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I buy it. I mean, it was pretty funny. I liked him going against the Stephen Hawking voice, so. I thought it was funny. They didn't really show you too much, but you don't need to see too much. You know, there's Zoolander. So, Mark? Uh, yeah, I, I buy it for what it is. What I really wanted is to see this in a theater. Like, some, you know, you, you always see trailers that they get released online. That's how you see it. And you know, you're clicking on the Zoolander 2 trailer. I would have loved to have been surprised by this and just been watching the beginning of this and be like, what the hell movie is this? Is this some sort of serious? Is this like the sequel to Interstellar? And then slowly you get little hints that this is getting ridiculous and silly. And it's like, oh, Zoolander 2. The jokes at the end hit enough. So for a teaser, yeah, I buy it. I, Zoolander is one of those movies for me that I still, about 15 out of the 30 nights a month, I will fall asleep to with Zoolander on the TV. I love Zoolander. I've been dying for a sequel. This trailer sucks. I sell this. This trailer sucks. This has gone from being a pithy, 
you know, kind of juxtaposition thing of the world of fashion with intelligent stuff. It's stupid guy and blah, blah, blah. And in the original Zoolander, Derek was simple, but when it came to certain things, he was actually incredibly intelligent. They did that in certain parts of the movie where, where he's simple, yet really smart in some things. And this just felt like a, this felt like a Beavis and Butthead trailer. Like in many ways, the feel of it was like a beef. And I just thought it was nonsense. And now for the first time since even the concept of a Zoolander 2 came up, which I've been so excited about. I now I don't care about this movie now. You think just that is what this trailer has done for me. I do not care about this movie now. I mean, but he was dumb in the first one. But but you're saying that they're just making him broadly stupid in this one. It just feels like they're going, you know, let's just go as stupid as we can. Like, it, honestly, uh. it felt like a trailer made for. I don't know. Babies? Like, babies. Maybe that what would be What if it was called two, the two Lander? You would hate it? Well, more no. Or less? Well, well, I mean, <laughs> if, if he was Roman. <laughs> I, 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 the jokes it felt so obvious. It's two and, in the Z. I, come on. I, no. John, didn't. come but on. This is I wanted. You know, this, I've been looking forward to this movie more than any of y'all at this table. I was right. so excited for this. And now I'm like, I don't I even care I think it's because you were it. too excited. Maybe. About it. I think that you could were. That could be it. Uh, maybe yeah. you were expecting to see like footage or something. You're like, when are they going to get to the footage? Why do they keep showing out of space? Maybe that was it. Is that why you well, didn't no, shave I, this morning? Because I, you were so depressed I, over I was so down about this. Yeah. I, I, I can't even eat. I, I saw him at a gas myself. station playing with the gas. Like, I saw Maybe it. I was like, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. you go, go. Okay. What's next? <laughs> Speaking of new trailers, a brand new spot for the upcoming Anne Hathaway, Robert De Niro film, The Intern, has arrived. Ben Whitaker, Robert De Niro, is a 70-year-old widower who has discovered that retirement isn't all it's cracked up to be. Seizing an opportunity to get back in the game, he becomes a senior intern at an online fashion site. Mark Byers saw the new trailer for The Intern. I buy it. I'm really interested to talk to Schnepp about this because <laughs> Schnepp had some very, at our pre-show <laughs> meeting, Schnepp was very uh, fervent in his opinion about this trailer. I certainly For me was. personally, I felt like it was pretty much the same beats as the first one. It was. It took itself a little more seriously. It wasn't as uh, humor-based as the first one, but I, I liked seeing De Niro in there. I think it's going to be a good role for him. He looks like he really commits to this. He's not mailing this role in. Him and Anne Hathaway seem to have a fun dynamic. I like that Renee Russo is in it. I think yes. she's going to be fantastic in it. Yes. Adam Devine is hilarious. Seeing him interact with De Niro is going to be funny. And the way that De Niro interacts with the other males in the office seems like it could be a good source of comedy. So we got more in this than we got in the Zoolander teaser. And uh, <laughs> I, I think this movie is going to be a pleasant surprise. Schnepp. I, well, we were, me and Ellis were talking. I was like, you know what? I did not like the first trailer for the intern. It felt like that Google intern, goofy, like slapstick kind of ah, bullshitty okay. kind of uh, those kind of comedies that I absolutely hate. And so I was like, ah, I'm not going to see this. I don't care if De Niro's in it. It looks like garbage to me. And then this trailer, I, I bought into it. They just subtly changed the trailer enough and showed just enough more story points, more human elements. Tonally, it feels different and enough where I'm like, all right, I'm, I am buying into this. I do want to see this film now because of Robert De Niro's performance and that he wants. He's just like, look, I want to try something different. And I'm, I, I'm old enough, whereas it's, it's, it, this trailer felt like how you should treat older people. You should treat them with respect and they have something to add. They have value. And that's what I think this movie's going to show. So What I really liked about it, and what I liked about the other one, too, because for me it's a buy. I, I did enjoy this trailer quite a bit, is that unlike, say, you're right, when you read it on paper, this film feels like it could be in danger of being what that Vince Vaughn, Owen totally. Wilson, Google internship. I can't even remember the name of that movie. The was. internship. It was the internship. Yeah. You know, it could be like that where it's like the ridiculousness of these guys who have no idea about this new world and trying to understand the new world. When I watch this trailer and the original trailer as well, what it feels to me is like the filmmakers are turning that around and saying, this is a guy who's bringing the older, more solid values, if you will, into the new environment mm -hmm. that this new environment tends to be making. What I loved about the first trailer and that they carried over to the second one, it almost is like, especially that one scene in this trailer where Anne Hathaway, Robert De Niro, Adam Devine, the other guys are in there, and like Anne Hathaway goes, what has happened that in one generation, men have gone for <laughs> from Harrison Ford, Robert De Niro, uh, I think she was Jack Nicholson to this and a bunch of slobby guys, uh, you know, whatever. And it's true. And I was listening to Robert De Niro talk about this is that not in terms of machismo. People think you're talking about how men have forgotten how to be men. He thinks you're talking about machismo or something. He goes, no, 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 that's it. It's 
there's a, a dignity, there's a class that you want to bring that, that re regardless of what background you come from, whatever, you carry yourself as a man, you know, the sort of thing. And, and I love that they kind of want to introduce that into this. I think Robert De Niro is going to do this brilliantly. I love, I think Anne Hathaway is the right person to do that against. Mm -hmm. I think there's two terrific performers. And you're right, I watch this because you never know with Robert De Niro these days. If he's gonna, if he's gonna mail it in, right. or if he's gonna give you a um, Silver Linings Playbook kind of performance, like which one are we gonna get? This one seems like one he has some passion for, and I liked it. I am so glad I bought this trailer because you guys <laughs> just made two of the best sales pitches I have ever heard on this show to see a movie. All of a sudden, this movie is not like The Force Awakens. Like we need to go see this movie. I'm excited for this. <laughs> All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can just email it in any time to collidervideo at gmail.com. Send in your questions, and maybe you'll see a pop-up on one of our shows. So, Ashley, what do we got? Ryan Proctor writes, Hey, guys, what's up? I'm a huge fan of the show. My question relates to a sequel to the upcoming Fantastic Four reboot. Several months ago, a release date was announced for the film, and ever since, we have had different stories regarding the troubled shoot of the reboot. With that being said, do you think the studio is having second thoughts due to the embargo for reviews on the new film, or are they overly confident that the film could get a sequel? Your thoughts? You know, we, we touched on this on Heroes. Uh, I can't remember it was yeah, last week last or the week, week before, or something like that. It's fantastic for, just to you know, bring us up to speed here, Kind of negative thinking about it for when it for news first came out. They, you know, Fox didn't do a good job with the first two Fantastic Four films. Then they announced the Fantastic Four Babies cast and all that kind of stuff. But as time went on, you real, I, at least for me, I'll just speak for myself personally. I really like the director they got in Josh Trank. I really like the writers they brought on. We got Simon Kimberg in there. I really, this is a uber talented cast. This is an incredibly talented cast, loaded with talent. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, the trailers come up. I bought into the trailers. It got to the point where I was said, I am excited for Fantastic Four. I am actually really pumped to see this movie. And now Fox is doing everything they can possibly do in their power to convince me otherwise. They're like two things. Well, it really comes down to one. They have, they're, they're hiding this movie from critics. They're not showing this to critics. Now, this is not about, oh, critics feel entitled. That's not it at all. This is Fox wanting to make sure no word about this movie gets out. They do not want, what, what Fox is doing, because they're only showing this to critics 24 hours before the movie opens. And then have a, like a, a review embargo to like tw something like 12 hours before the movie opens. I can't remember the exact time. This is Fox. I said this on uh, Heroes, waving a giant flag that says, we don't like our own movie. We don't <laughs> believe in our movie. It's, it's almost like they're trying to convince me that I shouldn't look forward to this. This is a horrible sign. Horrible sign. So I don't know what to think anymore. It took them a year to bring me to the point where, yeah, not only am I over my pessimism, I'm actually excited about Fantastic Four. I think this is going to be a good movie. I'm excited. And now they're like pissing on my enthusiasm. They're like, no, I guess we're, we're, we're going to hide this movie. I'm, I'm stunned by this move. I can't believe that they'd be this stupid to do it like this because even if the movie's good, they're sending out these flares that we don't believe in this movie and it's like killing my buzz, man. Anyway, Mark, how do you see all this? I feel the same way. Now, luckily, I have the magical ability to shut my brain off from all the outside noise and so when I'm seeing a movie, I can just judge it based on the movie and just based on what I've seen of this film so far, I'm excited. I see it Wednesday morning. I don't know when I'm allowed to talk about it. I think the next day, but I'm I'm pumped to see Fantastic Four because like, like John, I love the trailer so far. I'm like, this looks awesome. I am not a huge Fantastic Four fan. I didn't even see the other movies. I don't really care about them as a comic book You're lucky franchise. Man. But this made me excited to see and learn more about these people. So you're right. It is, it's shocking to me that we don't know more about this and that even if, if Fox didn't think it was a good movie, why wouldn't they act like it was? Like, like yeah. fake it till you make it kind of thing. Fake it till you At <laughs> least have a good opening weekend because based on the, the materials that they've showed us, it looks like it could stand on its own two legs at least for three days. 
before the word gets out, but it's, I, I, I don't understand. Maybe it is part of a strategy they've had since way back. It doesn't seem like that to me, though. I just, I smell something's wrong at the studio about this movie. I just can't put my finger on it because everything I've seen looks awesome. I like what you're saying. Look, you got to believe in your own movie. And if you don't, at least act like you believe in your own movie. It, it just like, be a guy on a yeah. first date when you're clearly outmatched, as I have been many times. <laughs> act like you're supposed to be there, even if you're not. Snap. <laughs> well, I'll say this. It's it's very disappointing the way Fox is treating this film. As a, as a fan of Lee Kirby, John Byrne, the Hickman run, a whole bunch of these comic books that have actually done really great Fantastic Four stories, I was super disappointed with the last two films. I'd you know, rather forget about them. Seeing this new, new reboot and hearing about it early on, I wasn't 100% sold with the direction they were going. Oh, they're going, taking the Ultimates. And then as I saw footage, as I saw clips of it, as I saw the trailers, uh, we've talked about it now for, since its inception, basically, for, for, throughout all of Movie Talk. And all of us here slowly turned around to when we saw the trailers, like, this looks like it could be really fun. It looks like a horror sci-fi superhero film. It looks different. It looks this, that. Then to get to this point, like two weeks before, like two weeks ago, we're like, well, when are, when are the reviews going to come out? Nothing. Oh, they're not screening it for anyone. They're not even having a red carpet for it. It's like, it's like, they're definitely the people at Fox are hiding this film. Whether it's good or not is not why they're hiding it. There's something that something else has got to be there. I, I don't know what it is, but to me, uh, it just makes me want to see the film even more now. I mean, it's so, it's so, so sometimes it's like, ah, don't look behind the curtain. Well, what's behind the curtain? <laughs> Nothing. To, don't be so concerned with this. Here, look at this shiny thing over here. What about that curtain that's over there? What's behind that curtain? That's what now I'm more interested to you see. You know what it. the problem is, though, is that that shiny thing is Mission Impossible 5 because that's got great reviews yeah. and that's going into its second weekend. And so now it looks even worse when you juxtapose these two films where one's coming out and has all this great buzz. The other one has no buzz whatsoever. It's like a graveyard. So right. I want the movie to be good. I want to go see it on Wednesday and be like, yes, you guys need to see this movie. It's like the it's it's Ant Man again. Trust me. I just I'm not that confident anymore. Well honestly you know? it feels like Fox is 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 setting it up so that it fails. That's what it feels like. It, By it, doing it feels like that. Yeah. Now and here's the thing we all let's keep this in mind too. The obvious thing here is that Fox is hiding the film. But as we have learned in Hollywood the obvious thing is not always the actual facts. There are a million possibilities underneath the surface. Look, maybe this was a matter of, you know what? Damn, they're not done the movie. They literally finished the movie, the last edits, the last thing they wanted to do 24 hours ago. Maybe this was an instance of, who knows? There are a million other possibilities that we wouldn't even consider as to why maybe perhaps... Fox has delayed and not put out any press screenings, any promotional screenings of this film until the day before release. The obvious answer is they're hiding the film, but it's not always the obvious mm. answer. So when you go see it on Thursday or Friday, when we all go to see it on Wednesday, we got to walk in, like what Mark was saying, we got to walk into that movie theater and we got to put all of this drama out of our minds, just sit down and watch the movie for the movie. And hopefully come Thursday morning or Thursday's movie talk, we're going to be going, guys, Fantastic Four has been redeemed thanks to Fox, whatever. And just keep our fingers crossed and let's see if that's the case. Yeah. Em embargo or no, y'all are getting an emoji as soon as I'm out of that theater Wednesday morning. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What's next? Fernando Solas writes, Hello, John Cambia and the Collider crew. Hello. I have been seeing a common trend in which critically acclaimed movies suddenly get backlash when they get recognition by award. For example, Gravity. When it was first released, everyone I knew loved it, but as soon as it was nominated for an award, those same people said it wasn't good. This has also happened to Argo and Birdman. The question is, why? Why do critically acclaimed movies suddenly get hated on when they get nominated for an award? Thanks and bring on the filthy. Um... I think there's a couple of different dynamics here, two of them that are probably the biggest reasons. Number one is take Avatar, for instance, because I was one of these people. I saw Avatar. I liked Avatar. I'm like, hey, Avatar is really good. Yeah, go see it. Avatar is really good. Then it gets announced as one of the favorites to win the Oscar. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> it's not that good. You know, so I think with Gravity, I saw a lot of that. A lot, a lot of people wanted to go see it. I was like, hey, you know, that was really kind of cool, very original. The Dead of Space, only a couple of actors. Man, that was a really fun movie to see. Then it gets comes out as one of the favorites to win the Oscar. And it get a lot of backers. We're like, wait a minute. It was good. It was not that good. It was didn't deserve to win, you know, or be up for this or that or whatever. I think the second dynamic at play here is that it only matters when you can have a voice. And what I mean by that is 
you know, Birdman comes out, it's a little film, you watch it, you didn't like it, whatever, I didn't like it, so you're quiet about it. But now all of a sudden, Birdman's up for best picture. And now you're like, hey, well, I want to give a voice to this now. It's like that guy running for president who got two teenagers pregnant when he was, you know, when, when they were 17. And everybody's like, who cares? Blah, blah, blah. And now he's running for president, hey, and they all come out of the water. I, so I think that's two, <laughs> two things. Number one, it's... <laughs> We still care that you got him pregnant, okay? We're just even less enthused about yes, it if you're now, running for president. Yes, now it's a bigger deal. So I think, number one, it's the, hey, it was good, it wasn't that good thing. And the, the number two thing is that when people don't like a movie, it was like, who cares? It was just a movie, whatever, they're quiet about it. But it starts getting accolades, and then we want to give our voices to it. So I think those are two primary things. But there's probably other stuff. How do you see that? How do you think that? Why well, does it work that way? For me, it just makes, it reminds me of uh, when you're into a band and no one knew about them. And then they're like, "That's my band," like and you're Nickelback. telling other people, "Yeah, like, like, <laughs> like John's favorite band, Nickelback." I was going to mention it, but Canada's John can't be his favorite Canada's band, Nickelback. Nickelback. <laughs> I don't even know why. I don't want. Let's not. I want to try to erase Nickelback. My Nickelback erasure, erase, erasure. Let's talk about that band. Remember them? I remember so, erasure. Erasure. They had a couple hits. Anyway. What I'm trying to say is, like, when you're into a band that's not as popular, like when John was in a Nickelback when he was in high school, <laughs> and then they get really big, and everyone's like, Nickelback, they just did the song for Spider-Man, Nickelback, and John's like, hey, I was into them before they were popular. I don't know if they, they should get that kind of acclaim or that, that much prestige. I think sometimes that, ha that happens when, when, when movies that you're into all of a sudden get this bigger kind of prestige or awards. You're like, I, I don't know if it's that good or if it deserves that much. It's kind of like the thing that you like gets a bigger glow or a bigger shine. It's a it. hipster mentality. Yeah, it's a little hipstery, I think. It's also just competition, too, because you got to remember that when you're competing, it's it, it, you're doing it for fun, and then when you're done competing, everybody can be friends again. Because like, if you take what's the best movie this summer, and Schnepp says Ant-Man, and John says Mission Impossible 5, and I say Jurassic World, because we're going to be in an argument, we have to poke holes in the other one's theory. So even mm. though I loved Ant-Man, and I love Mission Impossible 5, I'm going to have to tell them, oh, you know what? Well, your movie lacked story. Your movie like this and this. My movie had huge dinosaurs and yours didn't. So you have to, by the very nature of it, once you start having movies that are competing for awards, you start looking at like which one is better. You enjoy them individually. When they have to match up, there can be only one, like Highlander. That's and they that is the DC versus Marvel fanboy mentality right there. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, I like Batman more, therefore I have to say everything by Marvel <laughs> <Totally>. sucks. <laughs> no, yeah. That's true. Yeah. All right, what's next? Stephen Potju writes, hey guys, love your show. I've been curious as to how actors slash actresses get paid for doing movies slash TV shows slash video game productions. Do they get paid based on their net worth slash salary or is a completely different process to this? I'm not completely sure and I thought maybe you could help out. Thanks. It's like a snowflake. So Everyone is unique. Uh, you know, it's, first of all, it, it, this raises an interesting thing. There's a misconception amongst a lot of uh, film fans that you know, all these movie stars, they just get offered roles. Like every, every role that they get, they just get offered roles. And, you know, a lot of the time, and that does happen sometimes, that does happen. But a lot of the times, these movies, even actors you know, go in and have to audition. I remember when we had James Gunn in talking about Guardians of the Galaxy, and we were talking backstage about all the actors that, like these, some A-list Hollywood actors that came in to audition and to read for Star-Lord. To, to star in that movie, right? Guess what? These big, famous, rich Hollywood actors, even they have to go in and audition sometimes and have to get approved and whatever. And, and a lot of times, too, you know, a movie in advance will know this is our budget. I mean, this is what we've got for actors and actresses, and it's up to the actor or actress if they want to go for that or not. Now, sometimes actors and actresses, they have a general writer where they say, for me to be in any movie, I don't step on foot on set unless I'm getting $7 million or unless I'm getting $15 million or unless I get $4 million, whatever. But I think a lot of time it's like, hey, um, we went through the reads. We want to offer you the, the role. We think you were the best one for it. We think you're the best suited for it. You were the most impressive. And uh, they start contract negotiations. And that's when you hear that you know, a studio and so-and-so have entered talks. That's because they've gone through that first stage, and now they're at the stage of working out the details. Okay, so now you want how much? Yeah, that's not going to happen. We're going to offer you this much. And then they say, well, that's not going to happen either. And then they start figuring out their number. Uh, when you're Jennifer Lawrence right now, you can say, I get $15 million a film. And if you want to, which she has done from time to time, say, oh, this project looks really cool. I'll do, okay, I'll do that one for three, whatever. Um, but it's it's unique to every situation. Schnepp, as a director, even in animation and stuff like that and on television, I'm sure 
dealing with talent contracts and how much they get paid is something you've had to deal with before. Yeah, especially, I mean, luckily with SAG, I mean, there's a very straight, you know, animation, yes. you know, this is how much you get for one voice. If you do three, you get this. So we've never had to deal with that. That's always an outside force. Um, with my more independent projects, it's on a project by project basis. If it's going to be done online, then you have the new new web the new media you know contracts, which are far less money for everyone. Everyone gets to share in the pain of not making money when you're <laughs> online. So it's sort of like everyone you know everyone's uh, pay scale is is much 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 lower, and uh, you know that's why it's like it's a, it, the web is the wild west is right, that's what it is right now. So it's all Bitcoin out there. Yeah, hey, <laughs> is your face on a Bitcoin? You you got Skeletor? You got that Skeletor Bitcoin? Is it Nickelback or Creed? Which one do you have? It's like, I don't know. But yeah, it's like, uh, you know, once you get into like, you know, you're actually doing TV shows and or movies, there's a kind of a, a regular pay rate that you get. And then if your star starts to shine and you're making more money for the studios, they're going to pay you more. And that's when your agents come in to renegotiate your contracts and stuff. And so. also isn't just like always like one big check. It's like, right. oh, I made $10 million for this movie. Like Tom Cruise probably has points on the back end of Mission Impossible 5. So that movie makes a certain amount of money opening weekend, he gets a percentage of that in addition to whatever his fee But that's was from a contract for. to contract right. basis. Yeah. As, as a in-demand celebrity in Hollywood and entertainment right now. Thank you. How do you deal with those sorts of negotiations? I make $15 a night at the World Famous Comedy <laughs> Store. It really, I mean, even when you're, when you're a comic, it, it, it varies from club to club and whatever they're willing to pay you. And sometimes you will have offers. Like I signed something a couple of years ago where they would either pay me $200 up front to do some online stand-up thing or they would give me points on the back end once this thing blows up. And I'm like, I'll take my $200 in cash. <laughs> I've never seen a cut of it since. So, All right. Last question of the day. Kendall Ganaway writes, greetings to you all at Collider Movie Talk. I was wondering if you all have heard anything else about G.I. Joe 3 and the characters that might be in the movie. I was a big fan of the animated cartoon, so I would love to see the Crimson Guard commanders, Tomax and Zaymont, in the third movie. Also, I think Storm Shadow and the Baroness would be a big plus to bring back in the franchise. Thanks for all the movie news. I really enjoy watching the show on YouTube every chance I get. As far as who they would bring in if and when they do G.I. Joe 3, who knows? I and mean, we don't know anything about the film right now. The last I heard, uh, well, John M. Chu, who, was, who did number two and was supposed to do number three and then left number three, thank goodness, because I did not like the job he did with number two at all. Uh, despite having the rock in it, they, they kind of they they blew that film. Actually, neither of the first two films have been very good. Really, the first one wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Uh, I actually didn't think the first one was wretchedly awful. I didn't. I thought it was there was some redeeming qualities to the first one. The second one, I thought the first one was better than the second one. Anyway, um, the last I heard, director DJ Caruso came on board, and this is around April, I believe, came on board to direct and redevelop a new script for because I guess they got rid of the old script they had for GI Joe three. Now, Crusoe's directed films like Disturbia, which I think he did a really good job on, mm -hmm. um, Eagle Eye, which I also thought he did a really good job on, and I Am Number Four, which I will leave that to you to decide what you thought of his job on I Am Number Four. But <laughs> generally speaking, I, I kind of like this guy's sensibilities and his direction. I think he could be a, a really nice choice to direct G.I. Joe 3. But that was in April. I haven't heard anything else since or any movement. So, Snap, what have you heard anything about this, and what would your expectations be going into a G.I. Joe 3? I've heard absolutely nothing. My expectations are medium, which is like well, I thought the first film was, yeah, it was okay. And the second was like, yeah, it's just like the first one, okay. I didn't hate them and I didn't love them. I thought, you know, I expected more out of a G.I. Joe film because the animated series, especially the last one that, uh, that they put together was pretty fantastic, I thought. Um, so, you know, whether they're going to make a G.I. Joe 3, they're just w losing money. I think the more they wait, they should just get on it. So mm. there is a, it's a franchise. Mark, I remember hearing the Caruso room, and that was the last I've heard of anything new. Uh, I like G.I. Joe Retaliation just fine. G.I. Joe The Rise of Cobra, I actually got up about 40 minutes in, walked my took us out the door, and said, I will take my business elsewhere because this is a pile of garbage. <laughs> I did not like the first G.I. Joe at all. I hated it, and I gave Channing Tatum the most crap of all, and then he became a really good actor. So if I criticize you, don't worry. In five years, you're going to be a huge success <laughs> negotiating your deal for your standalone X-Men movie. I'd like to see another G.I. Joe 3. I like the second one. I, I thought it showed promise. Let's have more. All right, well, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, 
Lots of great films are playing over at our friends at AMC Theatres. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater, showtime, and of course your movie ticket information. If you want an audio-only version of this episode, that's right, for a limited time, the podcasts are back. Look in the description of this video and you'll find a link to our podcast feed. But most importantly, subscribe to this YouTube channel and stay up to date on everything going on over here at Collider Video. I want to thank the guys joining me at the table. First of all, sitting over here on my left, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at John Schnepp and at TDOSLWH. And you can find my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, at www.tdoslwh.com as a digital download or a Blu-ray. Of course, sitting over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? Well, John, you were asking, how do comics feed themselves? Merchandising. You can go on <laughs> iTunes and buy my album, Get to the Castle. It's on there right now. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at 5150 Ellis. For the record, I never asked how comics feed themselves. <laughs> no, <you're Sitting> <laughs> <laughs> and of course, our lovely host today, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? On Twitter and on Instagram, at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And uh, you guys can find me on all the various social media networks. Follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, where I actually will sometimes announce a lot of stuff going on with uh, Movie Talk in advance. Just follow me at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is John Campia, and until next time, free Brady. <laughs>